Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to this ordinary meeting of the East Riding of Yorkshire Council, 3rd of April 2024. And welcome to our many viewers on YouTube. Please ensure mobile phones are switched onto silent to avoid any disruption to the meeting. If the fire alarm sounds, you will be directed where to go. Please follow the instructions given by the officers. And please, can I take this opportunity to remind members of the protocol to be followed at this meeting and the procedures in place in relation to speaking, which must be adhered to at all times. And uh, can I take the opportunity to welcome to the chamber Councillor Ross Harrison, ward member for Tranby. Give us a wave. And Councillor Tony Henderson, ward member for Minster and Women's Eve also is waving. I would point out members that uh, if this meeting goes on beyond five o'clock uh, I shall have to leave the chamber because I have a, an engagement in Hull and I shall leave you to the tender mercies of our vice chairman. Right, Tina, there we go. Would you get to lead us in prayer? Good afternoon. Lord God, we thank you for all who serve us in this community as county councillors, those gathered today for the business set before them, and those unable to be here today. May all members and officers serve with integrity, honesty, and put the needs of our communities at the forefront of all that they do. We thank you for them, for the skills and knowledge they offer in service of our communities. We give you thanks for the award of 246,000 from the Libraries Improvement Fund to the Bridlington Libraries. And we pray that many groups would apply to the new Do It For East Yorkshire Community Grant Fund this year in support of so many much needed community activities across our council area and for the officers who so ably assist all applicants. We give thanks today for our chairman as his second term draws near to its close, for all that he has done for the council and those he has supported in these past two years. We pray too for those elected in his place for the coming year. In this Easter week, we pray for all Christians celebrating, for all Jewish people preparing for the Passover Seder later this month, and for all Muslim people keeping the holy month of Ramadan, and preparing for Eid, and for all people as they respect those of any faith or none. We pray for good community relations and for all enjoying a break at this time, especially our young people in the run-up to important sats and exams. Gracious God, may your kingdom come and your name be hallowed. Amen. Please join me in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to the Reverend Tina Minette Stevens. Alan, will you confirm apologies for absence, please? Thank you. Item one. We also apparently have an apology from Councillor Holmes. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Item one, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? Councillor Owen. Yes, thank you, Chair. And the two motions I'm putting forward, uh, my son is a funeral director, which pertains to one of the motions, and my wife is a member of the Beverly Beekeepers Association, which pertains to the other motion. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Councillor Owen. 
Any further declarations? Oh, sorry, Councillor. Interest in respect of item 9B, as I'm a member of Yorkshire Wildlife and also East Riding Rural Partnership. Thank you, Councillor Wilcox. Any further declarations? Councillor Catton. I'm a beekeeper. Seconded for Councillor Owen. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Catton. Perhaps in future, when we ask for declarations, you press the button and I can see your names on the screen. Thank you. Item two is minutes. I move that the minutes of the meetings held on the 21st of February 2024 be approved and signed as a correct record. Councillor Meredith. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, at our meeting last time, just over a month ago now, we had a rather unusual set of circumstances where a motion was amended not once, not twice, but thrice. Uh, that obviously led to some confusion and there is an element of the motion that is missing from the minutes as printed. Um, for those of you um, who aren't quite as nerdy as I, uh, a quick refresher. The original motion as proposed by Councillor Redshaw was then amended by Councillor Steele on behalf of Councillor Dennis. That amendment was passed 2420. Uh, the element that was included in that amendment that is absent from the minutes is that... Excuse me, two minutes... Um, that given the toxic nature of creosote, a recognised carcinogen, which has seen its uh, use restricted since 2003, um, calls upon government to require that green poles be installed and that creosote be banned in any and all public spaces. There were two further amendments, uh, one from Councillor Gill, and that was relating to requesting that telecom providers utilised green poles voluntarily, and a further amendment from Councillor Healy, and that was to uh, reaffirm the position of this council that I think the exact words were streets blighted by thousands of poles. Um, neither of which of those amendments suggested the removal of the elements where the government was requested to ban the use of creosote in public areas. Uh, and so I believe, therefore, that that should still be included and that, in turn, the council should be acting on that as an instruction from this, this chamber. Thank you, Councillor Meredith. Can we have a show of hands to agree that that should be included as uh, previously excluded from the minutes? Thank you. Okay, I shall move again then uh, the minutes of the meetings held on the 21st of February 2024 with that amendment this approved and signed as a correct record. Beg to second, Chair. All those in favour, please show. Uh, members, please use the magic buttons in front of you. Plus, green for in favour, red for against. Petitions, there are no petitions. Questions by electors, there are no elector questions. Communications, we have a communication which I shall read out to you. The Council will convene an extraordinary meeting on the afternoon of the 16th of May to make its final decision about the proposed deal for a mayoral combined authority. The final deal is due to be laid before Parliament earlier than expected, and as the Council is due to meet for its annual general meeting on the morning of the 16th of May, it feels appropriate to allow that meeting to conclude as normal, but not as members to return on another day for a single item agenda. And so, members following refreshments after the conclusion of the AGM, I've been asked by the uh, Interim Chief Executive to point out they are not substantial refreshments. Following refreshments after the conclusion of the AGM, the extraordinary meeting of the Council will convene at 2pm. End of communications. Item six, minutes of the cabinet and committees. I move that the minutes of the meetings listed at item six on the council summons be received and the recommendations contained therein be approved, with the exception of minute 66 24, 
I mean, it's 7224, exempt item of the Cabinet held on the 19th of March 2024. Minute 19, stroke 24 of the Children and Young People Overview and Scrutiny Subcommittee held on the 13th of March 2024. And minute 624 of Environment and Regeneration Overview and Scrutiny Subcommittee of the 6th of March 2024. I believe, Sam, that's 824, isn't it? So, so there's a correction to that one. It's minute 824 of Environment and Regeneration uh, Overview and Scrutiny Subcommittee of 6th of March. There's few 624, I they believe, was declarations of interest. So I move that. I uh, beg to second, Chair. Thank you. If you would like to vote using the buttons on your microphone, green for those in favour, red for those against, and blue to abstain. Thank you. That is carried. Accepted minute, the Cabinet. Minute 66 stroke 24, Beverly Park and Ride Scheme. Please note that other councillors can speak on this item. The usual rules of debate of five minutes allowed, and they can only speak once. Councillor Handley to move. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to move the accepted minute. Thank you. Councillor Dewhurst to second. Thank you, Chair. Back to second. Councillor Estelle. Thank you, Chair. I um, wanted to accept this minute um, to open up discussions about a long-promised park and ride in Beverley um, coming from contributions to develop uh, from developers funding a park and ride scheme. And unfortunately, this accepted minute is also highlighting, yet again, the residents of Beverley, promises that have been made for years and now promises which are seemingly going to be broken. Residents in Beverley have, for long periods of time now, um, had elements of housing that have been built on a green um, field to the south of Beverley, and they've been promised infrastructure that's going to come with this development. Residents are not against house building, and I as a ward councillor for this ward, not against the building of housing. We all see the importance of it. It brings in much needed money to, and contributions to um, our commuted sums and section 106 monies, but it also allows for residents' families to grow up in the town that they grew up in and allows for us to develop our town in a progressive way. But by going back on promises of infrastructure, we are doing our residents down. We're turning our backs on them and we are allowing ourselves to be led down the garden path when it comes to advice that has been given to Cabinet. This has been the, the housing developments that, are, that we've been talking about have been built on green fields. And I'll just give you some examples. Long Lane has always been a quiet lane, going through pasture land and farmers fields used by uh, farming vehicles, horses, cyclists, dog walkers. And now we have to have signs that actually say Long Lane is a quiet lane. It always has been before there was house building down there. England Springs Railway Crossing, used by many families for generations to walk their dogs, taking the scenery of our beautiful countryside that was once on their doorstep. Now closed. Why? Because of the house building that's being taken place on there, it's now dangerous for the families that are moving in. These are some examples. Now, when it comes to the park and ride, this has been on the table for 20 or more years because there is a need for more parking within Beverly Town Centre. 
um, and to free up that space. We also have commuters that come into the town and we have uh, a large tourist attractions as well. And there needs to be space for them to park. This has always been part of the master plan. If people drive and turn off the roundabout near Lidl, they will see a roundabout sign that's partially blanked out. What is on that sign? A sign taking people towards the park and ride. This is a broken promise made by um, Conservative run cabinet and without proper scrutiny. It's really important that this is now challenged. Residents deserve proper infrastructure. The house building is needed. They agree with that. But they also want the infrastructure that comes with that. Now, nobody here is suggesting that the council starts to fund a park and ride. Developers were going to be putting in uh, £4.8 million to pay for this park and ride to be developed. Where is that money going to go now? Has anybody asked the question where this money is going to go now? I didn't see any questions being asked about it at Cabinet. That would have been one of the first things that I would have asked. That's why I'm asking it now. That's why it's being called in and questions need to be answered so that our residents understand what's going to be happening with the money that should have been going in and investing in their local area. Thank you, Chair. Where's two seconds there, Councillor Still? Uh, Councillor West. Thank you. Just to highlight that this topic will be revisited by the Environment and Regeneration Scrutiny Committee on the 18th of this month. Could you speak up, please, Councillor West? Sorry. Is it on? It is. Just say that this topic has been revisited by the Environment and Regeneration Scrutiny Committee on the 18th of this month, and that some of the topic, topics regarding parking are currently being looked into by the Car Parking uh, Review Scrutiny Committee as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor West. Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Sell, for the brief history of development in Beverley, although I noted you missed out the simple fact that we now have something called Fleming Gate with a 546 space multi-storey car park in the centre of the town. And if you look at the annual car parking review of East Riding Council, it shows there are now regular surplus of car parking spaces in the centre of Beverley since that development took place. But I just wanted to answer the point as the Cabinet Member for Planning regarding what else could such monies be used for? And that is down to a Section 106 agreement, which is a legal agreement between the council and a developer. So that will have to now be renegotiated if that money is not used for a park and ride. Although I think it's also important to highlight all cabinet discussed was the financial viability of a park and ride scheme, which, as I said, because of Fleming Gate, and we now have regular surpluses of car parking in the centre of Beverley, we do not believe is financially viable. Thank you, Councillor Hammond. Councillor D'Altry. Thank you, Chair. It's just for clarity, so I can confirm that the park and ride has just been put on the back boiler for the time being. It's still going to be looked into. We're not actually saying it's a big no-no. It's just been put on the back boiler. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor D'Altry. Councillor Johnson. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, this park and ride, that, as uh, my friend Councillor Astell has said, has been prized for 20 years. And the people of Beverley who have to suffer from not being able to find a car parking space, particularly on a Saturday, who have to deal with traffic queues continually around the town, who are saying what happened to this council's encouragement for active transport, for people walking and cycling, when all of a sudden the park and ride is going to be cancelled. If you look on Facebook, on the Beverley Facebook pages, you will see that people are saying, why are we not getting a park and ride? We've been promised this for 20 years. And all of a sudden, it's a no-no. This just seems to me to be the wrong decision. And I'm, I'm completely with Councillor Astell when we say that we're just letting our, our residents down and we're letting our visitors down even more. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Heed. Chair, thank you. Uh, this isn't really about a park and ride. It's about an issue which goes to the very heart of the decision making process in this council and the extent to which Cabinet challenges and scrutinises officer recommendations. It's the vexed question of are we member led or officer led? 
In the days leading up to this cabinet meeting on the 19th of March, I sent an email to every single cabinet member, giving them plenty of time to reflect before the meeting. And I'd like to quote from that email. I said, the financial argument in the report is predicated on the premise that the council will operate and manage the park and ride on the assumption that no commercial operator will be prepared to run it. Indeed, the report states that officers have held informal discussions with commercial bus operators who have indicated that the site would not be economically viable for them to operate. You might, I say, want to consider asking officers for times, dates and records of these meetings with commercial bus companies. The report states that the likelihood that a commercial bus company could manage the site once it becomes operational appears low. There is no evidence for this conclusion, I said, and you might want to ask officers to exhaust the possibility of attracting a commercial operator before they ask you to jettison the project. As it currently stands, there is scant evidence that these conversations have happened. This, I said, is a decision for cabinet, but I would like to suggest that you resist the pressure that officers are exerting in demanding an immediate decision. You might want to consider deferring this until you are satisfied that conversations with commercial operators have actually taken place. The premise of the report in assuming that the council would need to take on the operational costs of running this deserves to be challenged, I said. Officers have not tried hard enough with investigating this and their desire to scrap the whole scheme at this point is premature. The private sector may well be interested in operating the park and ride. Well, Chairman, you may be surprised to hear that only one of the 10 cabinet members bothered to acknowledge my email, and that was Councillor Jefferson, for which I thank her. And you may be even more surprised to know that at the cabinet meeting itself, not a single member chose to question officers on the issue that I had raised about the nature of these informal conversations with the bus operators. And this, despite the Director of Asset Strategy stating, quote, we have had some discussions, but they have been very informal discussions with commercial bus operators. What exactly does that mean? What is a very informal discussion? There is something here that does not quite ring true. Instead of questioning officers about why they were dismissing the possibility of a private sector operator, cabinet members instead chose to ignore that and simply state the obvious about it being financially unaffordable for the council to run the scheme. No one disagrees with that. It's economic madness for the council to buy buses and employ bus drivers. Is this the best way of spending our East Riding pound? Asked one cabinet member. And they continued, I have aspirations for every child to have a home, every vulnerable adult to have the right support and care. I don't see this as the best way of spending our East Riding pound. Well, we can all say amen to that, Chairman. But the point is, that cabinet were missing the point. No one disagrees that the council is in fire dire straits financially, and no one is suggesting that the council chucks public money into operating something that is not affordable. And of course, our vulnerable children and adults are more important to me than a concrete car park, and how preposterous to suggest otherwise. But why did the cabinet not challenge officers on their working assumption that it will fall to the council to manage and operate the park and ride? Why are officers so coy about the very informal conversations, quote, they have had with the private sector? And why did Cabinet fail to hold officers to account over this, despite the fact that I asked them in an email beforehand? Colleagues, it is because there are so many unanswered questions over this that the Liberal Democrat group and the Labour group have suspended this Cabinet decision by calling it to scrutiny. And this will be considered by an extraordinary meeting of the Environment and Regeneration Committee later this month, when I hope that this issue gets the due scrutiny that it deserves. It's 15 years since the calling mechanism of cabinet decisions was last used. But if this unconsidered, unchallenging approach to cabinet decision making continues, we can expect to see it used far more frequently in the future. Colleagues, I urge you to receive this cabinet minute with regret. Thank you, Councillor Healy. Councillor Lee. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yet again, my Liberal Democrat colleagues have got the cart before the horse. As Councillor Healy has already indicated, uh, this will come before the committee which I chair, the Environment and Regeneration Scrutiny Committee, in due course in a week on Monday. And as my colleague Councillor Hammond has said, look, it's the privilege for us to be here to ensure as elected members that we challenge the officers decisions of course it is 
But at the same time, we're also here to ensure that that famous phrase, value for money, is always achieved. So to broadly go ahead with a decision that was made on the assumption of 20 years ago's uh, analysis is just absurd. Um, so it's rightfully coming before the committee with a recommendation to go to cabinet to review this. But at the same time, uh, having this before council today, as I said, is the cart before the horse. As a frequent visitor to Beverly on a regular basis, in 22 years, 23 years since I've been up in East Yorkshire, I have never ever failed to find a parking space in Beverly within four to five minutes, never. Um, what we're talking about here, uh, with good justification sometimes, is the use of a park and ride car park probably for uh, individuals who work within Beverly who need it to park in effect for free. Uh, and don't want to pay for their parking during the day. That will be reviewed. But at the same time, it, discussing this today is discussing something with uh, little or no information. Uh, this has to be a commercial decision. It has to be something which offers value for money. And it's very, very important that, uh, with great respect to my learned members opposite uh, on the other side of this chamber, that we don't grandstand on the pre premise of trying to look to see we're supporting our residents. When in reality, we need to ensure that we have value for money through the whole of this council. Um, and yes, if there is a commercial operator that comes in and says, here's the required money, no expense to East Riding of Yorkshire Council, of course it will be looked at. But that is, those discussions were taken, they, they did take place prior to it now. Um, and obviously there'll be an, an additional effort to see whether any updated offer can be made from an independent operator. So let's just wait and see, shall we? Uh, we're all keen to get good services for residents, but I really do think this is just uh, a bit of polit politicking today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Councillor Nilden. Thank you, Chair. I, I will be supporting the motion to receive this with regret. Um, I hear the, the words of Councillor Lee and Councillor West talking about scrutiny as if somehow this is yet to be decided. But I didn't hear them say we will look at this in an open and honest way. Uh, what I tended to hear is they're going to justify the decision they've already made. I read the report on, on the park and ride and, and the bit I found quite a serious omission was, was the reference to any on street parking issues that residents in Beverly face. Uh, and th there was no reference to that. The argument for not having the park and ride seemed to be about there are some spaces in car parks. Well, what we do if you have to pay six pound a day to park your car in a car park and you can instead park on a residential street most people are going to park on a residential street and i got no sense from this report about what the problems are in terms of on-street parking issues and i know in the past we've talked about extending the um uh, residents exclusion you know, residents parking zones um to try and deal with the problem that seems to get worse now except since covid things have changed but i didn't get any sense from this report that it was covering the issues of on-street parking that affect residents. I, and I'm sure others here, visit York on occasions, go with friends. Uh, I cannot believe that one could go into York without using the park and ride. You have to use a park and ride. It's three pounds, three pounds 60, um, a return journey. The idea that York wouldn't have a park and ride would be ridiculous. And to me, it seems that this is a situation looking to the longer term, we have a site that's allocated we have the means to, to build a park and ride. If we pull it, I think it will put the whole thing back another 20 years. Um, now, some references have been made to the finances uh, on, on this, but I, I take a view that you can find a solution to problems. In Hessel, we, we lost our Hessel bus that ran around the estates uh, and dropped people into, into the centre of Hessel. Uh, the council cut the service, they were under pressure, but Hessel Town Council stepped in and, and provided uh, you know, support for at least one day a week, the bus runs around Hessel and it provides a social function. It gets people who don't have cars into Hessel. Now, I'm not suggesting Hessel, uh, uh, Beverly Town Council are going to step in, but there are probably other ways of finding a solution to this. So I think this is definitely regrettable. I think it's a backward step. I think the omission of the reference to on street parking is a serious omission. And I would hope that the cabinet step back and look at this again. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Nolan. Councillor Dewhurst. 
Thank you, Chad. Just quickly to address the point about on-street parking. When I lived in Beverly not that long ago, I had a parking permit allowed to park on a street that uh, no one else could for more than 15 minutes. Um, there were also a number of council car parks around the corner for those who came to shop in the town. Um, just to take everyone back to the beginning here, the recommendation that was put in front of Cabinet is, and I will read verbatim, the Cabinet is asked to consider whether the park and ride scheme represents value for money, given the changes in anticipated demand, travel patterns and increased financial pressures since it was first conceived and decide if the park and ride is supported. Cabinet concluded that there were concerns about value for money, and the officer should go back and revisit the Section 106 agreement to see if we could find a, either a better solution to the park and ride or indeed something totally alternative. Without Cabinet giving that permission to officers, they are unable to negotiate with the developer over the use of that site and the money that has been promised. Just want to make that point very clear. This was not to cancel the entire scheme, to move away from any support or, 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 or not for the park and ride. It was to look at the entire thing again and see if 20 years on, in a post-COVID world, in a, a world with Fleming Gate and its 500 extra spaces, whether it is the best use of that piece of land. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Dewhurst. Councillor Handley, would you like to close the debate? Well, thank you, Chair. Yes, I would like to close the debate and I look forward to the outcome from uh, environment and regeneration. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Handley. I will now take the vote on whether to receive the binet with regret. Please vote using the buttons on your microphone. Green for those in favour, red for those against, and blue to abstain. Right. Uh, that uh, resolution to receive regret has failed, and we move on to uh, whether to receive the minute as normal. So if you would care to use the button, buttons in your microphone again, green for those in favour, red for those against, and blue to abstain. Thank you. Thank you. That is carried. So we have received the minute as per normal. Now I'll move on to accepted minutes. Children and Young People Overview and Scrutiny Subcommittee, Minute 19 stroke 24, Annual Education Report. Uh, Councillor Whittle to move that the accepted minute to be received. Councillor White. Uh, thank you, Chair. I beg to. I'm a big to second. Thank you, Councillor White. Councillor Aitken to speak. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. Thank you, Council. Um, this minute highlights the work and outcomes for children and families from the education and schools part of the Directorate of Children's Services. And this is for the academic year September 22 to August 23. The committee heard that the team has performed really well in lots of areas including school place allocations, which has been celebrated recently through the media, with 97% 90, of our East Riding children receiving a place at their school of first choice, which is really outstanding. Our school attendance figures are good, and the number of settings and schools judged to be good or better by Ofsted has shown tremendous progress over the past 10 years. So a big thank you to all our schools and for our staff for supporting the schools for this great work. However, challenges do include an increase in home educated pupils, which is often due to parental choice because of the lack of suitable provision locally. 
And the, the running figure at the moment is about 750 places that we could do with locally, which is a huge amount, and it's a big mountain to climb. A challenge that the director and the directorate and the wider council are working hard to change. We are continuously in conversations with the Department for Education to try and secure more capital funding. We all know that the best place for children to learn and to socialize is in school. The cost of homeschool transport, these figures are still eye-wateringly high, which again is exasperated due to also the lack of provision near to where a child lives. Home to school and college transport is one of the largest and most consistent source of spend across the council and one that we just must pay. Remember, that comes out of our general fund. That isn't out of the school's budget. I note that the committee wanted to champion our school music service, which has always been close to our hearts as elected members. And 94% of East Riding schools use the service to provide instrument lessons. This includes those class sessions, national curriculum lessons, as well as music for well-being which I'm pleased to say 47 of our primary schools we're working very closely with and we're aiming to increase that. Well over 6,000 children have weekly music delivered by our school music service staff. And on top of this, their work con continues with ensembles, rock bands, sessions with guitars to drums, violins to choirs, and much, much more. A gold award at a national concert band championship finals was recently achieved. And this again, continues to go on that long list of great things that our music service provides. The service was identified as a budget pressure in 2023-24, but we all agreed that we wanted to continue to support the service, even though it was not a statutory service like home to school transport or the provision of care. I have and will continue to champion on behalf of the music service. In our budget for 2023-24, we here gave a one year member initiative of 264,000 pounds to show our support for the service and to give officers a window of opportunity to restructure the service in light of budget pressures which are growing. And this was welcomed by everyone. And the work is still going on. It's not completed. The pandem pandemic and other national and international pressures have continued to challenge our local authority budget. Our budget for 2024-25, which we have just passed, still identifies the pressures within the system and the need to make changes And be assured, there is a huge amount of work being done across children's services and including the mus music team to not only continue to support those children already accessing the service, but to increase the offer to support social, emotional, and mental health in our young population. I hope that you as a council- I'm sorry, let... Councillor, can you run out of time? May I have, I've literally got two minutes. Can I, will you give me two minutes, people? Two minutes. Thank you. I hope you will all continue to support this service in future budgets. There is a lot of really good work across our children's services, and there is a lot of collaboration with partners who are working closer to support the needs of our children. The outcomes and provisions for our children is everyone's business, and we need to continue to bring everyone into this space. This includes our own residents, our business community, our health and police partners, because we must remember our children are, are our responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. And I apologise for the extension. That's all right, Councillor. Okay, now I expect nothing else. It says here that Councillor Whistle closes the debate, so I'm going to close the debate, but I would like to make an observation. 
and that is if you had been present at uh, Longcroft School recently uh, for a concert by uh, our children, it was absolutely wonderful. And equally, if members managed to get to the little concert we had here in this council chamber, which I requested in order to bring uh, your attention to the work of the school's music service, uh, I believe we all found that not only to be a thoroughly enjoyable session, but also quite emotional as well. Um, I would support Councillor Aitken in any way and means in which she could obtain uh, a way in which our school's music service can continue and not just to continue, but to flourish. <coughs> right, I will now take the vote. All those in favour, please press the green button. Red for those against, blue to abstain. Thank you, that is carried. I'll move on to accepting minute environment and regeneration overview and scrutiny subcommittee. Minute 8, 24, climate change strategy. Councillor Lee to move. Thank you, Chair. I'd move that the accepted minute be received. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Councillor Denise Howard. To... Back to second, Chair. Councillor Redshaw to speak. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Uh, the Environment and Regeneration Committee uh, received updates on the Climate Change Strategy uh, and the Environment Act uh, 2021. And I want to speak in support of the committee's resulting recommendation that this council declares an ecological emergency. Uh, now, I'm the first to acknowledge that a lot, a lot of good work uh, is being done by this council in respect of climate change and conservation. Uh, this is another step that dovetails with our initial, uh, with, our, with our existing initiatives to ensure nature's recovery is embedded at the heart of all strategic plans, uh, policy areas, and decision-making processes. Uh, the UK is facing a range of ecolog ecological challenges, biodiversity loss, climate change, habitat uh, destruction and pollution, all primarily from human activity. These and other environmental activities not only impact negatively on the environment, but also on the economy and society contributing to what many now consider to be an ecological emergency. Uh, the recent uh, State of Nature Report 2023 is the most comprehensive report on the UK wildlife, and it has registered a devastating 16% decline over the last 50 years, uh, with one in six, almost one in six of 10,000 species currently threatened with extinction. Uh, some species, in fact, show a much higher decline um, birds, 43%, amphibians and reptiles, 31%, terrestrial mammals, 26%, and butterflies and moths, 25%. Uh, in fact, butterflies are typically the first species to be affected by changes in habitat uh, or climate, and their decline really is a warning signal that we cannot ignore. Um, we also have, as a council, a responsibility to manage several internationally important habitats within the East Riding, including chalk uh, grasslands, wetlands, the wolves, and the Humber estuary, uh, supporting a range of priority species, including wintering and migratory waders and wildfowl. Um, so this council, as we all know, declared a climate emergency in 2021 after recommendations from the Climate Change Review Panel. And we're also involved in the Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission's Climate Adaption Programme, but a bolder coordinated approach is now needed to protect habitats. So firstly, I would hope we consider signing up to the YHCC Climate Pledge Initiative, which would commit us to a range of actions that will help, help protect the East Riding from climate impacts, put us on the road to net zero, boost nature to enhance the East Riding's wider environment and promote climate action in a way um, that involves everyone. Uh, secondly, by declaring a, a formal ecological emergency, this will add weight to the commit commitments of the YHCC pledge and align uh, with our uh, previous climate emergency declaration. It will be a logical evolution of activities currently being undertaken via the local nature recovery strategy, biodiversity net gain, and our enha enhanced biodiversity duty. 
and it will provide an opportunity for the climate and natural environment the strategic risk SRO6, which is currently under review, to be separated and aligned with the respective climate and ecological emergencies. Uh, if we fail to declare uh, an ecological, ecological emergency, we'd miss a real opportunity to, sh to show leadership and commitment uh, to address these issues facing our region. It will be a failure to align with many of the other local authorities across the country who have also already declared both a climate and an ecological emergency. And, and as a result, the, the authority may well suffer reputational damage. So to conclude, uh, declaring an ecological emergency declaration is a means of recognizing the severity and the urgency of the ecological situation. It will undermine, uh, sorry, underline our commitment to take action to protect and restore nature whilst reducing human impact on the environment. It will show that we intend to act on the causes and impacts of the climate and ecological crisis. It will add weight and support um, and support ongoing natural environment work streams and the statutory uh, requirements, whilst also demonstrating our practical support for the Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission's Climate Pledge. So I hope members across all political groups um, will therefore support this initiative and that the leadership of this council will continue uh, to advance the battle against climate change by both signing up to the YHCC Climate Pledge and by committing to declaring a formal ecological emergency. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Rachel. Councillor Lee to close the debate. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'd like to thank my colleague on the Environment and Regeneration Overview and Scrutiny Committee uh, for bringing this matter up at Council today. Um, it's a very important subject, absolutely, we all agree, and we are committed. And I just wanted to uh, commend our officers who are both committed and hugely knowledgeable on these subjects and are, I think, leading uh, many local authorities in this direction. And uh, uh, the uh, decision of the uh, Scrutiny Committee was, in fact, to recommend that this ecological emergency is pro pro progressed. Uh, and I hope the Cabinet Control will, will confirm that in due course. But thank you very much indeed for uh, bringing it up. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lee. I will now take the vote. Please vote in utilising the buttons on your microphone. Green for those in favour, red for those against, and blue to abstain. Thank you. And that, members, would appear to be unanimous. Move rapidly on to item seven, leaders update, uh, Councillor Handley. Thank you, Chair. It's difficult to believe that this time last year, we were all pounding the pavements, leaflets in hand, and trapping our fingers in letterboxes, but we were. And today, I would like to reflect on all our achievements over the past year. However, I would also like to reflect during that year of the passing of two very much respected councillors in Councillor Astle and Councillor Padden. Their loss touched everyone in this chamber. I say our achievements because working together across all the political and non-political parties I feel the East Riding has had a good year. So in no particular order, I feel there has been, across the board, more councillor involvement in decisions that have been taken, a case in point being the budget this year. It was accepted across this council and no alternative budget was put for forward. The first time ever. We finished with a balanced budget, which in these financial difficult times is a credit to the officers and Councillor Wilkin, Wilkinson as Cabinet Member for Finance. I look forward to and enjoy my one-to-one -one, one -one meetings with all the leaders. These meetings are always interesting and it gives us time to discuss hot topics that may need extra thought before coming to a decision. Going forward, leaders will be delighted to know that extra meetings will be put in their diaries to discuss budgets along with Councillor Wilkinson. I have an open door policy and that has worked very well for both councillors and officers. And the Cabinet and I welcome the strengthening of scrutiny 
we ask members to go away and, and develop. We believe that you holding this cabinet to account is vital to good member-led decision-making. On adult health and social care, in the past 12 months, adult health and social care have worked hard to facilitate our most vulnerable and elderly residents in ways for them to remain in their homes rather than entering into residential care. This has been achieved with new technologies that monitors residents' movements in their own homes. And in the event of a fall, their loved ones and the fall service are alerted. We are currently seeing a downward curve in, admit in admissions to long-term residential care. On leisure and tourism, we have delivered free swimming for all our young people during school holidays. It was so successful that this will now continue this year too. And on children and young people, Councillor Aitken successfully organised a debate in the House of Commons, along with David Davis MP, to discuss fairer funding for SEND. This was very well received across party in the Commons and is now being looked into how the fairer funding can be changed. On planning and public protection, we are leading the way nationally with our first ever authority-wide design code, giving more say to local communities over development in their area. We are improving relations with town and parish councils, recognising them as equal partners in delivering services for our residents. Some of the work undertaken to date to do this includes a new parish and town council newsletter, which goes out monthly monthly town and parish council webinars on topics of their choosing with cabinet and officers. Parish open door systems to allow closer working between clerks and officers and closer working with our police and crime commissioner, Jonathan Everson, to support victims and tackle crime. On corporate resources, we have undertaken an enormous process of evaluating one of the 11,000 job roles across our East Riding workforce to ensure that we are best placed as a public sector employer to retain and recruit staff as part of the total pay and reward scheme. That process is now reaching an end and I want to pay tribute to everyone in the People Services team who have worked collaboratively and efficiently with union representatives to deliver this hugely complex programme. On digital, the East Riding is more connected than ever with the rollout of the free public Wi-Fi to more towns, marketplaces and beachfronts across the county. East Riding of Yorkshire Council is now providing easy and reliable internet, internet access for residents and visitors in key out, uh, outdoor areas of Bridlington, Driffield, Goul, Hornsey, Withensey, Beverley, Pocklington, Hedden and Howden. The free Wi-Fi supports local businesses, allowing market traders to take card payments more quickly and efficiently, as well as improving internet access in outdoor spaces at cafes and pubs. On the rural front, the East Riding of Yorkshire Rural Partnership celebrated its 25th anniversary in March. The partnership was formed in 1998 to ensure the rural voice was heard by government. And that means the people of living in the countryside were addressed. Through its support for the rural partnership, East Riding of Yorkshire Council has demonstrated that rural really does matter and it recognises the distinctive need and opportunities in its rural communities. It is a tremendous achievement that the Rural Partnership has remained active and effective for 25 years, and it continues to go from strength to strength. On coastal communities and heritage, the Council has been very fortunate in receiving a grant of £15 million for the Changing Coast East Riding Project, which allow us to work with communities 
to trial ways of supporting them in ways we haven't been able to in the past. This could include the replacement of community facilities and housing. Clearly, officers are working hard to engage with a wide range of schools, universities, parish councils, businesses, etc., to identify their priorities. Work is ongoing to implement the Bridlington to Humber Bridge section of the King Charles III England Coast Path. This will build on the launch of the Bridlington to Filey Brig section, which opened last year. And finally, I couldn't have a council meeting without mentioning devolution. Last week saw the leader of Hull City Council and I sign the first draft to be sent down to Westminster. I would also like to add the leader of Hull City Council, Mike Ross, has worked with me and between the two of us, we have visited over 60 venues to discuss the deal. For my part, I am delighted with the professional working relationship this council has with Councillor Ross and his cabinet. We, together with you, have achieved something no one thought we could. I have also been flying the flag for the East Riding at various events across England, including Transport for the North, meeting with the Ambassador of Finland to discuss inward investment, meeting with the Ambassador of Germany to discuss carbonisation on the Humber, the County Council's network in Berkshire, the LGA conference in Bournemouth, various meetings with ministers in London, meeting with Lord McLaughlin to discuss transport issues in the East Riding, meeting with Lord Callanan to discuss funding for carbon capture on the Humber, and I have been a guest speaker at various events. All in all, it's been a busy year, but I was always taught you're only as good as the last thing you did. So, sleeves up and onwards and upwards. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Councillor Handley. Uh, we now have 10 minutes allowed for questions. Each member may ask only one question, and it must relate to the contents of the report. Councillor Nolan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I did wait until the word devolution came up, and I was pretty sure it was at some point, but I thought perhaps you're going to run out of time. Um, my question to the leader is, in view of the fact that when the public were asked about a mayor, 43% of East Riding residents were opposed, and only 42% agreed. If you exclude the don't knows, that means 51% of East Riding residents oppose the mayor and only 49% in favour. And can I remind uh, the leader that Brexit, ripping this country out of Europe, took place on a mere 52 to 48% of the vote. In view of this opposition from residents and the pitifully low response of under 1% of residents to the consultation, will the leader recognise that there is no mandate for a joint mayor and the plan should be dropped forthwith? Thank you. Thank you, you Councillor yes, Nolan. Yes, Thank you, Councillor Nolan. Councillor Hadley. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Nolan. Of course, I'm not going to just give you a one-word answer. That wouldn't be me. So first and foremost, Chair, through you, can I say, throughout the country, on consultations on the mayoral combined authority, by a country mile, the East Riding and Hull have had the more, most responses in the country. And can I just make a point of saying that's positive responses in the country, just to get that clear. Yes, Councillor Nolan is quite right that um, that was the difference of percentages in the East Riding. However, the other percentages that he hasn't mentioned is the huge majority of people that want everything that goes with the mayor. So you can't possibly have everything that goes with it, without taking the mayor as well. And across the board between Hull and East Riding, we have got a majority. And I'd also just like to add, the amount of people that have stopped me on my journey and said, why are you messing about? Just get on with the job and let's get some investment and let's get East Yorkshire on the map. So in answer to Councillor Nolan's question, it's not a simple yes or no, but thank you for your question, Councillor Nolan. Thank you, Councillor Handley. Councillor Estelle. 
Thanks, Chair. Um, and thank you to the leader for, for the speech. Uh, no, your point about the working relationship with uh, Councillor Mike Ross in Hull. So I'm just going to be a little bit tongue in cheek, if you would allow. And wouldn't you agree the working relationship would only be strengthened uh, and enhanced if the East Riding joined Hull and had a Liberal Democrat leader of the council? Thank you, Councillor Estelle. Councillor Handley, would you care to reply to that? Councillor Astle is such a little tinker. And with tongue in cheek, no. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Handley. Councillor Shepherd. Um, can I commend uh, the positive impact of the increased care in the home for our elderly residents, for free swimming for our young people, and also for the free internet for business as well? All well done, I feel. However, would the leader agree with me also that we need to make sure we arrest the decline of our road network and perhaps use the funds that come from devolution to do this? Thank you, Councillor Shepherd. I believe that was a question of sorts, Councillor Handley. It's falling over, sorry. Um, Chairman, yes. Uh, Councillor Shepherd, thank you very much for your question. And yes, I do agree with you. And we should use some of that money for devolution. Yeah, from devolution for our road network. Absolutely. Thank you, Councillor Handley. Councillor Healy. Uh, thank you, uh, Leader. Um, as she says, uh, we have set a, a model of working collaboratively uh, in an overall control council. Uh, and I agree that we have made huge strides uh, since May. She mentioned fair, fairer funding, uh, and this is probably our Achilles heel. How let down does she feel by her colleagues in the Conservative central government who are currently starving councils of the funding that we all need to provide proper services? Thank you, Councillor Healy. Councillor Handley. Thank you, Councillor Healy, for your question. And Chairman, all I can say is on behalf of East Riding and as the leader of East Riding, I will constantly keep fighting for more money for the East Riding. That is my job and that is what I do on a regular basis. So for us, I'm doing the best I possibly can to get us where we need to be. Thank you, Councillor Healy. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Handley. Councillor Needham. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, the leader positively states that she is treating parish and town councils um, as equal partners. And with this in mind, can I ask her if she'll look favourably on Pockington Town Council's proposals to complete an asset transfer of Burnby Hall and the Community Hall to a charitable organisation in the town at the Cabinet meeting on April the 16th? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dean. Councillor Handley. Sorry, Chair, I'm just having a problem. Um, yes, we will be discussing that at the Cabinet meeting and the Cabinet will make a decision, hopefully, in the right way for Councillor Needham. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Handley, for your update. There being no further questions, we will move rapidly on, doing a lot of rapidly today, to portfolio holder report. Now, the report will last for a maximum of 10 minutes. At the conclusion of the report, five minutes will be allowed for questions, and each member may ask only one question. It must relate to the content of the report. And today, members, we are... Pleased to welcome Councillor Wilkinson, the Portfolio Holder for Finance and Governance, who will make an oral report. Mr Chairman, thank you very much indeed. Um, as with the Council Budget a few weeks ago, this is the first ever portfolio briefing on finance and governance. So I, I seem to be doing a lot of firsts. We have heard in the press, and indeed in this chamber, that local government funding is a matter of great concern. So given I spoke at length only a few weeks ago about the future budget, I thought it appropriate not to waste everyone's time by talking about the budget, but to address how local government funding impacts this council. As we are all aware, in general, local authority finances have been under pressure for over many decades, but especially recently due to the many global issues. Some local authorities have been better at both working with their budgets and also preparing for the unforeseen. This council is one of those. 
it has worked within its budget and prepared for bad times by ensuring it built up some reserves. We are, however, all aware that pressures in adult social care, children's services and housing are some of the most significant pressures on our finances. The reasons are, of course, complicated. But certainly since COVID, the demand on these three services especially have risen exponentially from residents. Add to this rise in demand for services, the cost of living crisis and the fuel increases, etc., and it's not hard to see why our budget is strained. I am working hard with our corporate management team, the finance director and his team, to ensure that we have up-to-date financial information to work with. And personally, I am working with each portfolio holder to assist with the financial challenges each of them has to deal with, including attending meetings when necessary with them. This council is not alone in facing these challenges, as according to the LGA, over 72% of councils dipped into reserves last year, and 68% plan to do so this year. As you're aware from my budget speech, we have managed to balance the budget for 2024-25, but cost and demand pressures mean we continue to project overspends for 2025-26, 2627 and 2728 in our forecasting. Although these are future projections and we can address these on a year by year basis. We are, of course, also actively looking for council wide savings, and each directorate is being targeted to reduce expenditure by implementing the cost saving measures announced by our Section 151 officer at the beginning of this financial year. As previously informed, we are undertaking a major program of organizational transformation, which should yield significant savings in future years. And the next 12 months are critical to bring this to fruition and provide a more sustainable and financial footing for the council in the years ahead. This organizational transformation program is focused on three work streams, covering children's services, adult social care, and the wider council. All, all three will focus on digital and agile changes and the development of commercial opportunities to maximize council budgets and improve services. And savings of 2.6 million pounds have already been built into the financial plan from digital and agile improvements. The aim is to create an organization that is lean and efficient and the removal of bureaucracy and delays. Now, there has been a great deal of work already undertaken on culture across the authority to ensure a focus on essential spending and value for money. A leadership event was held in February, attended by council members, executive directors, directors and their lead managers to promote a shared responsibility for addressing the council's financial challenges and a culture of responsible spending and clear messages that spending restrictions, including controls on filling vacant posts, will remain in place indefinitely. It also provided time and space for those officers to deal to share ideas to deliver the cost reductions and service changes that will be needed to achieve our financial stability. It is, of course, necessary for all staff to be involved. So regular communications are also being made by the manager's bulletin and the loop to ensure that staff remain informed and respond to the financial challenges which we continue to face and to reinforce the culture of cost consciousness. We're also making representations to central government on the need for permanent and fair funding solutions for local authorities which reflects current spending needs. We, of course, in East Riding are taking a new path with devolution. The Hull and East Riding devolution deal aims to empower the two local authorities by granting us greater powers and a simplified long-term funding settlement. Although my colleagues have briefed everyone on this, 
In my last few minutes, let me go through a few details. The government recognizes devolution as a crucial driver for improved productivity and reduced regional disparities. The leveling up white paper emphasizes the importance of local leadership, strong governance and collaborative efforts across coherent economic geographies. It encourages directly elected local leadership and flexibility in addressing local needs related to transport, skills and regeneration. The East Riding of Yorkshire is also set to receive over 12 million pounds of leveling up funding through government schemes, replacing the European funding that has come to an end. This injection of funds will support local initiatives and projects. So finally, in summary, while the funding challenges persist, the devolution deal, the changing culture, the savings council-wide, the organizational transformation, and the targeted funding will empower East Riding of Yorkshire Council to financially be able to address the unique needs and drive positive change within our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Councillor Healy. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Um, we know, and you said that you're working very, very hard, and no one doubts that for one moment. Um, but is it going to be enough? We heard at the recent Cabinet meeting that since uh, the, the budget was prepared uh, 24 or 5, just a few weeks ago, when all that diligent work took place to balance the books, that the financial positions continue to deteriorate and that this is now impacting on the 24 5 budget and that we need to take further mitigating actions. And we did actually say at the time that we were in the last chance saloon this year, but things haven't really got off to the start that we'd hoped for. So can Councillor Wilkinson tell us honestly, despite his skills and despite his hard work, is he going to be able to fix this? Or are we, one of the many councils, now hurtling towards a Section 114 notice on the back of this Conservative government's fixation with starving local government of the funding it needs to provide local services. Thank you, Councillor Healy. Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, might I rem remind all members, by the way, that uh, when you stand up to speak, you don't need to press your microphone button again. It comes on automatically. Um, thank you, Councillor Healy. Um, I understand your concern. Um, you had the same concerns um, at the budget speech as well. Um, and you mentioned some time previously about um, my email to you, reassuring you and the residents that we were going to be okay and that we had strong financial accounts, which we were using. Now, clearly, as you're aware, we are using a lot of our reserves, as many councils are. We were in a fortunate position of having those reserves to make those changes. Would you expect me as the portfolio for finance and governance to actually panic all our um, residents by saying that there was an issue and we couldn't afford it and we were going to go into section um, 114? No, of course not. I'm really, sorry, not Cam I'm really sorry, Councillor Wilkinson. Could you go through the chair, please? Uh, it's through the chair. Chairman, I, I was being um, reasonable to, as I was actually answering a question from an individual, but I'll be happy to look at you if you insist I don't look anywhere else. Um, so, of course, um, I wouldn't do that. I want to reassure our residents that we have not planned any cuts in services, that we are not looking forward to a Section 114. Could I promise you and everybody, absolutely not, that the everything's rosy? Of course not. I said financial problems persist, and they will persist. Um, however, we have reserves, and we will be looking at those in order to ensure that this year remains a balanced budget. I assure you of that, and that we have a balanced budget forecast for next year. And that's as far as I can go. Um, I do understand your concerns, as everybody should be concerned. It is difficult. I'm not prepared to discuss what national policy is. That's not my remit here, I'm afraid. Maybe if you want to vote me in and uh, I'll go down to Westminster, I'd be delighted to do that. But sadly, I'm not in a position to do that. But thank you for the question, and I hope I've answered it the best I can. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for your update. 
Um, given the budget pressures that we're facing, that, that you uh, rightly said over the coming year, what we've heard this year is that our road network is in managed decline. What I would like to understand in the next year, are we going to see other services that we offer as an authority going to manage decline? And what is it that managed decline actually really means? Thank you, Councillor Smith. Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, thank you for the question. And, and again, yes, you and probably everybody in this chamber is frustrated by the fact that we cannot, through you, Chair, we cannot um, upkeep our 2,000 miles of road in the level that we would expect. It's frustrating. And financially, it is impossible for us to do so. We do not have the funds available to do that. So, yes, we are doing the best we can with the funds we have. Would I say that funds would change next year? Well, hopefully with devolution, there is a 168 million that's coming through, which could be looked at by the mayor, the elected mayor, to actually look at transport, which is one of his roles or her roles. Who knows? And, and, and I'm hoping that, that our road network will be one of, the, one of those things that we will be able to look at. Bear in mind that unlike Hull, which is very combined and very, very um, uh, 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 actually uh, has a, a small amount of road network, that the East Riding has 2,000 miles of road network and it is difficult to upkeep all of it. But we will be doing our best with the funds that we have. Uh, and when funds become available, we will continue to improve our road network. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, we've got 30 seconds left, so Councillor Jefferson. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I just wanted to ask you, Jonathan. No, it'd be Nigel if I said this, I wouldn't it? Nigel. Um, it's because I'm sat here thinking, um, which is a good thing sometimes. However, I just wanted to say to you, as a fellow Cabinet member, that this council should really think that this man actually puts 26 hours into 24 hours. He works non-stop. Can you assure me that you promise me you're not going to take any more of my reserves away that we've been saving for years and years and at least get us back onto this balanced budget we're trying to do and to say that all the cabinet members are looking towards that? Thank you, Councillor Jefferson. Councillor Wilkinson. Councillor yeah, Jefferson, you sit on the, the cabinet with me. You, you're fully aware of, of um, what we are doing. We will do the best we can with what we have. Um, is it perfect? No, but it will be the best we can. Thank you. I'm afraid we've run out of time, Councillor Shepherd. So uh, your, your desire to speak has been noted, but on this occasion, it'd be less than successful. Move on to notices of motion. On this first motion, I would like to remind members that the focus here is on regulation of the funeral industry and that any comments should be limited to the scope of the motion and should not stray into the subjects of open investigations by the police. Otherwise, we run the risk of going shooting off in all directions and not actually getting anywhere. It's all about regulation. We said that the move of the original motion has 10 minutes. Seconders and speakers have five minutes. The council can only speak once other than the move of the motion. Seconder may reserve the right to speak. And to move, we have Councillor Owen. Thank you very much, Chairman. And uh, in light of the comments you've just made, I will keep this short and hopefully sweet in terms of comments I, I, I wish to make. And I, I hope people can take the motion as printed on, on the paper. To suffer a bereavement is probably one of the most horrendous experiences one can suffer. And never is there a more important time to be able to put your trust in someone who can help and steer you at your most pressing time of need. It is almost expected without thinking that at that time, your greatest support, apart from family, and friends is that person you entrust your loved ones with 
the undertaker or funeral director. It was therefore with horror and amazement that we recently received the news of issues with the legacy funeral care business in Hull and Beverly, and a story that has gone global with press coverage. My son is a funeral director and a senior regional delivery manager for a well-known national chain of funeral care supply. In his words to me, and I quote him, there is undoubtedly a huge variance in the dignity, care and respect provided for the deceased across funeral directors. The reason being there is no meaningful independent oversight. Currently, regulation is mainly focused on the protection of clients' money and the focus of clients' vulnerability in that area. So the Financial Conduct Authority regulates prepayment plans and the CMA, the Competition and Markets Authority, regulates very loosely the consistency of pricing in funeral homes and behaviours around the funeral arrangements, inspection of which does not seem particularly well resourced. There is currently no regulatory oversight of other aspects such as care of the deceased. What there is, is the voluntary membership of organizations such as the National Association of Funeral Directors, who will carry out a biannual inspection to enable continued membership. In fact, myself and anyone in this chamber could start operating a funeral business tomorrow. Scotland will actually lead the way with the minimum standards for deceased care when they introduced the statutory code for funeral directors in March 2025. England and Wales, sadly, will inevitably be way behind. Although we do not know the details of what has been going on regarding the legacy funeral care business, it has certainly highlighted the need in the strongest way that there is that need for proper regulation as there is across all other areas where we are dealing with our fellow human beings. No person, family or friends, should ever have to question or worry about the treatment of the bereaved in our society. Therefore, the motion I put before you today, calling for us to ask for our MPs to support better regulation. As a final point, can I express my praise and thanks for the rapid response from this council and Hull City Council to take on board communications and dealing with those who need help and support. Is anyone affected? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Owen. To second, Councillor Tucker. That's working now. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, I beg to second this motion. I would like to reserve the right to speak. However, Given that it's a live police investigation and the sensitivities you talked about, it's highly unlikely that I will speak. But I will reserve that right, and I do beg second. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Tucker. Councillor Estelle. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this was actually a, a motion that I was going to bring myself. Um, uh, Councillor Owen um, already uh, put it in. but So I'm not going to spend too much time uh, talking about this. Uh, due to the ongoing police investigation. Um, but this is an issue that's impacting um, in our ward. Um, as ward councillors, it would be only right for us to, to talk on this issue. Um, you know, the distressing nature of the, of the case is causing immeasurable pain and hurt to, to the families of the deceased um, at an already difficult time. Um, this also, unfortunately, includes my own family. Um, my mum's late partner, Mark, was under the care of Legacy in 2021 after his passing. Um, and the way he was cared for is being investigated. Um, and this, for my family, is reopening uh, pain and um, grief and causing a lot of uncertainty um, at a difficult time already. Um, but in December 2020, the Competition and Markets Authority's Funeral Market Report um, found the functions of funeral directors are largely unregulated um, and quality standards in the provision of funeral director services are not prescribed by law. 
and there are no statutory inspection regimes uh, in relation to the services that are provided by funeral directors in place. Um, in response to that, in March 2021, the Ministry of Justice um, responded to the um, Competition and Markets Authority's report to, by agreeing in principle to form um, to a form of registration and inspection. Um, of course, there are also industry bodies that represent funeral director businesses uh, and give guidance and codes of best practice, um, which are voluntarily signed up to by most funeral directors. And uh, as Councillor Owen has already said, I think it's fair to say that the fact that the funeral market is, is largely unregulated industry was, was a genuine shock to everybody. Um, and, you know, I would like to, um, you know, just add a small, if Councillor Owen would allow and accept this, a small amendment to the motion, uh, which is to include that we also further write to the Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice to request the legislation that was agreed to in principle in 2020, uh, sorry, 2021, uh, is brought forward and the funeral director market become regulated through registration and inspections. Uh, thank, thank you, you Councillor Stowe. Councillor Owen, would you accept that uh, small amendment? Absolutely delighted to accept that, yes, thank you, Jim. And Councillor Tucker? Thank you. Councillor Henderson. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair. I've been a volunteer for a local charity as a trustee and treasurer for over 10 years. One of the services we offer is a preschool. Many of the attendees are vulnerable two, three and four-year-old children. The preschool is registered with a governing body, Ofsted. The social workers that work with some of these vulnerable children and families are governed and regulated by Social Work England. Another service the charity delivers is a free advice service to the community. People experiencing hardships and challenging times feel unsafe and vulnerable, turn to professional advisors, and this service has governance and legislation from the AQS, which is the Advice Quality Service. When we are poorly and feeling weak or possibly needing more intensive treatment, such as an operation or stay in hospital, Again, vulnerable and in need of care of strangers, we turn to the NHS, who I also work for. This is governed by the CQC. When we need help, support and feel vulnerable, we turn to trusted adults, the police, GPs, teachers, social workers, and on some occasions, counsellors. When we lose loved ones through bereavement, we are at our most vulnerable. We turn to funeral directors, often strangers, we trust them with the people we love, the most vulnerable of all. People need to know that their loved ones are at peace and resting. People need time to grieve and closure. I have spoken to funeral directors and constituents in our area and know they feel the same way. These are just some of the reasons I support this motion and request remove funeral homes and funeral directors to a place of regulation, legislation, accountability and governance for how they care for our lost loved ones. Chairman, in view of the delicate nature of recent events, I request that we move this motion straight to a vote. Thank you. Are we happy to demonstrate acceptance of moving it to the vote? I'm sure, if hands will be nice. Thank you. And I will call upon Councillor Owen to close the debate. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you other members that have spoken. I, I think for once it's nice not to have a political issue to debate in this chamber, and I think hopefully everybody will be happy with uh, the motion as printed with the amendment that's going, slight amendment going forward. So thank you for your time, Liz, and thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor and Gracious as always. Uh, I will now take the vote. Uh, please vote using the buttons on your microphone. Green for those in favour. Red for those against, and blue for abstentions.
Thank you. That is unanimous and that is carried. We now move on to Councillor Irwin. Thank you, Chairman. And again, can I please take the motion as, as printed and, and read and uh, slightly less sombre topic, I think, uh, this one, hopefully. But you may find it rather different that we now have a motion regarding an invasive species to the UK. You know, it's not something I think we've discussed before in this chamber over the years. But, but why have I brought it today? And what's our role as a local authority? And I, I admit from, from the start that my wife is an avid beekeeper. So I declare that interest as a bee widower from the months of about May until September and October each year. Seriously, though, a brief background and a bit of history. The Asian hornet was confirmed for the first time in the southwest of France in 2004, thought to have been imported from a consignment of pottery from China. It established itself and quickly spread to many regions of France. And as of December 2022, it was established in Spain, Belgium, the Netherlands, Portugal, Italy, Switzerland, Germany, and more recently, Jersey. It preys on a wide range of insects, including honeybees, and seriously disrupts the ecological role they provide. It has altered the biodiversity of regions in France where it is present and can be a health risk to those who have allergies to hornet or wasp stings. In 2016, the Asian hornet was discovered in the UK for the first time in Tetbury. And after 10 days of intensive searching, the nest was found and destroyed. In subsequent years, there have been further sightings with action taken to find and destroy nests. With climate change, there is a fear that the hornet will become increasingly found in the UK, particularly in our south coast areas around ports of entry. There have been instances locally, though. In 2023, there was a nest found in Yarm in the northeast and two found in Hull, both of which were destroyed, probably coming in on consignments of timber, but that's not uh, definite. We're all aware of the importance of the honeybee to the pollination of our crops and other plants. A single Asian hornet colony can produce on average 6,000 individuals in one season. They predate on honeybee colonies from July until the end of November hovering outside the hive entrance, awaiting returning foraging bees, which they then catch, take away, and feed off the protein-rich thorax of the honeybee. Their brood requires animal proteins, which they themselves turn into flesh pellets and feed to their larvae. The hornet also preys on other pollinators, such as butterflies, already at risk, as we heard earlier in, in uh, previous discussions. The British Beekeepers Association and DEFRA have a wide range of literature on the identification of this quite distinguishable insect and are constantly monitoring it. And all of you have, I think, on your seat uh, a copy of one of the leaves that's been, that are circulated. Cynics amongst us may suggest that we are only awaiting what will be inevitable by trying to stop its progress. But the longer we can stall its progress through the UK, the more time we have to learn how to adapt to its presence. This council has officers already aware of the importance of monitoring the hornet and are closely in touch with the likes of Beverly Beekeepers Association, who, along with other associations across the country, are building teams of people who could help monitor, track and destroy the hornet's nests. My motion today is around raising publicity of the issue. The local association are already distributing leaflets to our parish and town councils, and I just ask members that this council continues to be proactive in raising awareness and leading the way in our very rural and agricultural landscape. I hope you may support the motion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Councillor Casson to second. Um, thank you, Chair. And th thank you, Councillor Owen. As a beekeeper, I attend to seven of my own apiaries and have about 20 hives. As a member of Beverly Beekeepers and of Cottingham Beekeepers, Asian hornets are a serious topic at our meetings, especially after the Asian hornet's nest was discovered and destroyed in East Hull last autumn. We are trying to get the message through to all parishes and towns, and as councillors, could, we could all pass on this message to our parishes and residents 
Our plan is to observe, identify and report any sightings. As Councillor Owen has explained, these are very serious pests. For example, a single Asian hornet can take out 25 to 30 honeybees a day. In September, a hornet's nest has up to 60, 600 hornets. This means that they can empty or disable a beehive in less than a week. I found when it comes to pests, the most observant residents are gardeners. So perhaps we can ask our lo local garden centres to display information about these unwanted visitors. The, the more eyes looking, the better. So I am seconding Councillor Owen's motion. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Casson. Councillor Wilkinson. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I'll be brief. Um, my late father-in-law was an avid beekeeper and, and taught me lots of things about them, um, despite me not wanting to know. But then I suddenly realised just how important bees are and, and to us and, um, and that with the loss of them, we would probably not be eating very well. They've already been hit by climate change, by habitat loss, by invasive plants, by pathogens spread by commercial managed bees uh, and pesticides, terrible pesticides. But the most important one that my um, father-in-law was always worried about was the bee mite, the uh, Varroa bee mite, which was terrible and, and, and devastated many of his hives. This is just an added one onto all of these uh, and, and it, could be devastating to our bee population. I, I stress to everybody, uh, please support this. It's vitally important for us to keep living. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Councillor Johnson. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Owen, for highlighting this uh, issue. It's ab absolutely right that we should try to protect our bee population against anything which affects their existence. Um, as Councillor Wilkinson has said, the human race will not be able to feed itself without bees and other pollinators. He has also um, alluded to the fact that um, there are other threats to the, to the bee population. After all, 13 species of nating bees have been lost in the last 100 years, with 35 under threat. So it is bizarre that we continue to use these weed killers, these um, things like glyphosate, which have been banned by several other councils in the country and by several countries. Glyphosate affects bees by um, affecting their radar, so they can't do the little dance to tell each other where a source of pollen is to, um, to their hive mates. And it also affects the developments of young bees. Well, it would do if they can't be fed properly. So yes, we must be absolutely more vigilant against the Asian hornet but we must also protect our bees against other threats such as glyphosate and neonicotinoids, I can't even say it now, neonicotinoids, which this government has actually now backed track on using. Okay, it can only be used for against sugar beet, but even so, they have been banned in the rest of the world, so we, why are we not banning them here? But absolutely, I support this motion wholeheartedly. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Wilcox. Thank you, Chair. I strongly support this motion. They're not just unwanted visitors. Asian hornets are ferocious predators. They sit outside beehives and capture bees as they enter and exit. They chop them up and feed their thoraxes to their young. Just one hornet can eat 30 to 50 honeybees in a day. They become established, they'll be almost impossible to eradicate. If all our pollinators were lost, it would put two billion pounds a year on the production of food such as fruit and peas, as they would need then to be hand pollinated. Thus far, Asian hornets have been largely confined to the Kent coast, although some have been found as far away as Gloucestershire and Suffolk. Last year, there were 57 sightings, which is more than twice the number in the previous seven years. It's now feared they may have become established in the UK, as a queen has now been discovered, and the earliest sighting was on the 11th of March, which is four weeks earlier than last year. Many, as Councillor Johnson has said, many of our native bee species are already at risk, largely due to anthropological reasons such as previous intensive farming, habitat loss, monoculture, and neo, oh God, here we go, neonicotinoid pesticides. 
Asian hornets are therefore yet another risk. They're a huge risk. They can also kill. One sting can kill a person with an allergy. This is not a trivial matter. And Councillor Owen is very right to raise it, and I congratulate him for doing so. This council has a duty to make the public aware of the very real threat that these pests represent. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Wilcock. Councillor Aitken. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. And I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Owen for, um, for the motion. Um, a little bit of blue sky thinking going on while I'm sitting listening. I'm a gardener, I'm not a beekeeper. But, um, and somebody mentioned that we need to engage our gardening community. I think we need to be engaging our kids. I think we need to be spreading this message into our schools. I'm not quite sure at this immediate moment in time how we do that, but I think we should be doing, doing so. And I think that probably through our school support service, we can make those connections and ensure that we are, we, through yourselves as beekeepers, we can give factual information so that children and young people, when they're out and about in their gardens, they can be aware because obviously there's a danger to their future as well. And I'm also very conscious that I know our youth council members and our youth parliament members are very um, enthusiastic about uh, the green agenda and about uh, how we help support our flora and fauna. And I think that, again, I think that we might need to make those connections and I'm very happy to help facilitate some of that. So thank you very much indeed, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Aitken. Councillor Healy. Yeah, I just wanted to say this is someone who's got a wasp phobia. Um, I hate them. Uh, and I remember seeing these creatures in France when I was you know, a lot younger. And they, they look terrifying. And although there's a lot of stuff talking about the beak, I understand the effect on, on the bees. I'm also a bit worried about the, attack, the effects on people. Um, I think these thoraxes being fed to the, to the bee, it's kind of really scary. Um, I did a little bit of research um, and uh, apparently they're not, they, they can be quite aggressive to people as well, um, especially when they think their nests are under attack and they swarm after people. Apparently a, 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 the sting hurts a lot more as well. Um, I was also reading in the, in the press about AI being used to identify these uh, these insects because um, apparently although it's, it's great that we're doing this um, sort of getting the public to to look out for these uh, insects but apparently um, it's very hard sometimes to tell the difference um, between these insects and apparently I was reading that uh, of the sightings that people have reported only one percent are actually this Asian hornet and there's other kinds as well um, but overall uh, it's attacking our bees it's attacking us it's a well thought through motion um, and uh, yeah, I'll be supporting it. Thank you, Councillor Healy. That I'll call upon Councillor Owen to close the debate. Yes, thank you, Chair. I wasn't expecting to diverse into nicotinoid, and things like that, <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, there was another thing I should declare as an interest, which I forgot at the start of the meeting, is I am incredibly sensitive to bee stings. So I think I do have a vested interest in any motion or anything to do about them. And uh, along with the advice that was it your father-in-law, Councillor Wilkinson, gave you, my, my wife gives me similar advice over the years as well, and has taken it the same sense of responsibility afterwards. So, But thanks, everybody. It's a bit of a change to the normal motions we discuss in this chamber, and I'm pleased people are on board. And it is something I think we we'll keep an eye out for. And I welcome some of the ideas about widening that uh, distribution of knowledge to other people. So thank you. Thank you, members. I hope I have your support. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Owen. I will now take the vote. Please vote using the buttons on your microphone. Green for those in favour, red for those against, and blue to abstain. And you will be pleased to note that that is unanimously carried. Now move on to a further notice of motion to move Councillor Estelle. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, before I get going with this, there is a, a slight change to the wording of the motion as printed on the summons. Um, it's the... Um, 
resolves to sort of guarantee to wherever possible the offer of an apprenticeship. Um, so just, I'd, I'd say that first before anything else. Um, so as the motion uh, states, care leavers do face many levels of disadvantages, including difficulties accessing further education, employment, and also, um, unfortunately, in some circumstances, homelessness. Um, the council has a duty as corporate parents, um, and I hope everybody in this room at least recognises and acknowledges the role that we all play as corporate parents to our children who are being looked after. Um, we all have a responsibility for that, and we all have a responsibility to work positively to affect the life chances of our care leavers. Um, under the Children Act 1989, a child is legally looked after by a local authority if um, they get accommodation under Section 20 of the Children Act from the local authority for a continuous period of more than 24 hours, is subject to a care order or is subject to a placement order. And children in care are placed with foster carers, residential homes or with parents or other relatives in certain circumstances. Now, the Council's key duty towards looked after children is to safeguard and promote their welfare and to make use of services available for children cared for by their own parents, um, as appears to the authority that is reasonable. So essentially, we become the parent, the corporate parents of these children when they enter the system. And we have a duty to perform as parents would do in any um, family. Uh, now, children cease being looked after when they return home, they're adopted, or um, when a young person ceases to be looked after on their 18th birthday. Um, they become young adults, and many of whom are eligible for support and assistance as care leavers until the age of 2021 although we do have locally an offer uh, to 25, I believe. And our ambition in the East Riding is for all children and young people to lead fulfilling lives where they are happy, healthy, confident and safe. And we work in partnership um, to remove barriers to achievement and narrow the gap so that everyone can reach their potential. Now, members of the Corporate Parenting Board were presented with um, presentation. We always get these brilliant presentations by uh, staff in CFAS. And, um, you know, one of the things that we were disappointed to learn was that no care leaver currently is in an apprenticeship with this council. Um, we offer 600 services across this local authority. We've got something like 450 people, uh, children in, in, in the care system um, and we've got many care leavers. And the fact that we do not have any of them um, that are in an apprenticeship with us is disappointing. And not only that, but only two, two uh, care leavers achieved an apprenticeship with external employers. Um, we have a responsibility, as I've said previously, to give these young people the best possible start in life. One of the easiest ways that I suggested at the Corporate Parenting Board was to bring a motion to council, um, and at that point was to guarantee the offer of an apprenticeship to any care leaver who seeks one. Um, however, employment law prohibits us from being so positively discriminatory against one particular group. Um, so the amendment obviously is, is here as, as welcomed. But I would urge councillors to support this because essentially what this does is enshrines in policy from this full council that we understand the situation that our care leavers are in, uh, the unique nature of their circumstances, and 
implores on officers to work proactively to offer a care lever apprenticeship scheme to add in to our local offer for our local care leavers. Um, so I would encourage people to support the motion as printed. And um, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Stell to second. Councillor Sutton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm seconding this motion. Um, as a corporate parent, it's my duty to act as a champion for looked after children and care leavers and to look to ways to ensure that their needs are represented and their outcomes can be improved. And this motion is one way to help that. As we all know, care leavers have a very challenging start in life. Some children's lived experiences have been very traumatic and shocking. In my experience as a foster carer and an adoptive parent, I know that all children that I have cared for have struggled to move on in life, especially when faced with leaving school, going to the workplace, faced with a possible house move, and all things very difficult in life. Some of the care leavers will no longer be looked after foster parents when their money runs out at 18. A lot of foster parents don't have them anymore. And then they moved on to supportive lodgings. That is a fact of life. I'm sorry to tell you that. Um, they then go to the supported lodgings and then they don't know the people, then they're isolated. And many have no positive role models at all. So how do we help them gain independence, financial stability, and help them reach their full potential and improve their confidence? So I looked at it like this. What would I do if it's my own child? And this is the basic tenet of being a corporate parent. How can you help them be confident, independent young people? And supporting them in the workplace would be a good place to start. So I found this statistic on the website was 38% of care leavers between 19 and 21 were in the NEET, which is not in employment, education or training, compared to 11% of the general population. So this, this, this particular group of people really struggle in life. Here on this council, we need to do our little bit to care for these care leavers. And it's been outlined that the numerous positive benefits of offering apprenticeships to care leavers can bring. There are lots of schemes around the country uh, for care leavers, but uh, we don't particularly offer one much here. So I asked the young person I'm currently looking after, he's 16 years of age, and he wants an apprenticeship. So I asked his opinion on the motion, apart from the usual 16-year-old expletives, but there you go. Um, he said to me, well, he wanted to go to work, he wanted to earn some money, he hated studying, he was done with school, and he didn't want any tuition debt. And his current, uh, current goal in life was to learn to drive buy a car so we can go to watch all city and other way games right so god bless him for that um so every little bit helps to go towards like a care lever in their career so i thank you for listening and i hope you support this motion thank you chair thank you very much indeed councillor Sutton. councillor nolan thank you chair um our group recognizes the importance of this issue and indeed the sincerity behind the motion that's put forward um what is, what is refreshing to see is there, is there is a proposed action, because often it's too easy to support generalities. The action is referring to the resolves wherever possible, offer an apprenticeship with this council to all care leavers who seek one. Now, that's an admirable uh, approach to take. The bit we are unclear about is how many would that involve? We've been told it's zero at the moment. The 600, I think, leaving care it's going to be somewhere between zero and 600, and I'd probably be nearer to zero, I suspect, than 600. But the, it's the unknown implications of the council offering uh, the apprenticeship to all those who want it. And we are a bit concerned about other disadvantaged groups, such as the NEETs, uh, you know, neither in employment, uh, education or training, the people who drop out of school, um, where do they fit? And to some extent, if you prioritise one group of perhaps disadvantaged, you, you inevitably discriminate against another group. So we, 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 we like the principle, we just think it needs to be looked at in scrutiny. So in, in view of this, um, we move that the item be immediately referred to scrutiny to look at the implications and see it as a way forward, which perhaps could involve other disadvantaged groups uh, in, in so doing. So I move that it be referred to scrutiny without further debate. Do you have a seconder for that, Councillor Dunham? I hope so. <laughs> right, we have a seconder for moving it to overview scrutiny. Uh, 
Okay, use to utilize your little magic buttons uh, for moving it to overview and scrutiny. That's green for those in favor, red for those against, and blue to abstain. Okay, it looks as if we are not moving it to scrutiny, in which case we will continue with the debate. And I believe the next speaker was, oh, steady. Very, very enthusiastic there, aren't we? But the next speaker is, as you'll probably gather, Councillor Aitken. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. Um, and a, a big thank you to Councillor Estelle, Councillor Sutton, who I absolutely know are passionate corporate parents who sit on the corporate parenting board. And the reason that I actually didn't support the suggestion that this should be moved to scrutiny is that we actually already have a board who actually on a regular basis works with this as a subject with our children. We're actually bringing children who have experienced care into the corporate parenting board so that we can actually get the voice of the young person there. So I think it was, although I'm sure meant in the right way, Councillor Noland, unfortunately you're, you missed the, the reality of the situation in that we already have a corporate parenting board, which is part of, as you well know, Chairman, as you sit on the board, that the uh, corporate parenting board is dealing with this. Now, I absolutely support this motion. I absolutely am grateful to uh, Councillor Estelle and Councillor Sutton for, for this motion. And I absolutely will appeal to you all to support the motion because there is a real need for us as a huge corporate organisation to be supporting our children from our care environment. That being said, I don't want you to stay there. And I agree again with Councillor Estelle that we need to share that out further and encourage our wider economic partners our small businesses, our tourism industry. And as you all know, I was very passionate about our tourism industry while I held the portfolio holder for economic development. We have a huge, huge opportunity among that cohort of businesses who can be supported, because sometimes the business themselves will need some support to be able to support these young people. But I think as part of our corporate parenting strategy, which we are actually revisiting at this moment in time. And to, to be fair, this morning, one of my meetings this morning was to actually discuss the draft corporate parenting strategy with senior officers. I have seen it and they are literally just dotting I's and crossing T's and it will be becoming part of our consideration as a council very, very shortly. So I want to support this motion. I want to appeal to you all to support this motion and I thank you again for bringing it, the subject, which is hugely important. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Aitken. There being no further speakers, I call upon Councillor Estelle to close the debate. Thank you very much, Chair. And um, I'd just like to say thank you for the support from across uh, the, the Council um, on not going to scrutiny for exactly the reasons that Councillor Aitken has outlined. I'd just like to come back on some of the, of, of maybe the concerns that um, you know, I've outlined to, to to my group, and I probably should have outlined them a little bit sooner in my in my speech to the motion, which is that there are similar schemes across the country, um, and obviously, any discrimination as the equality, diversity, and inclusion champion for the council, not just a corporate parenting champion, um, positive action schemes are legal. So positive action can actually be used to develop people from underrepresented or disadvantaged groups to gain skills which enable them to compete with others and help widen the talent pool. And it is permitted by law where an organisation has evidence which is ideally gained from diversity monitoring, um, but not necessarily just that. We do have evidence here we have no care leavers that are currently in an apprenticeship with this council. I don't think you can have any more evidence than that. 
Um, we also, just in terms of financial implications, a really good part of the apprenticeship route is the fact that there is the apprenticeship levy. And the council has a large pool from the apprenticeship levy, which can help support us employ apprentices. So actually, you know, finances at the minute are really important. When it comes to apprentices, they're not necessarily um, going to be impacting us financially. And apprentices should not be used as an um, as a, a way to fill headcount gaps should be used to increase the headcount so that the person can gain experience and skills. So I'll leave it there. Just wanted to outline some of the concerns that might have been shared. And I am really thankful and I really hope that you all support this, which I can't believe, my first motion. Thank you very much. Really, Councillor Stump, first motion? I found that difficult to believe as well. I will now take it to the vote. Uh, please vote utilising the buttons of your microphones. Green for those in favour, red for those against, blue to abstain. And obviously I didn't need to tell you any of that because we've done it. Well, that looks very much as if it's unanimous. Thank you very much indeed. Now, members, uh, that brings us to the the end of the motions. And the next section is questions. And I have a question to ask you. Uh, would you appreciate a 10-minute comfort break before we move on? Okay, so moved.
Right, well, welcome back. I hope you're suitably refreshed and ready to rejoin the fray. We move on to questions and the procedure rule 7.8 in brackets little i. One supplementary question is permitted, providing it relates to the original question and no other councillor to speak or ask a question. And so we move on to Councillor Sutton. Thank you, Chair. Over the last few months, and particularly recently, many gardens were heavily flooded on First Lane and Lebay, posing a potential risk to property. These are adjacent to the multi-million pound and Lebay and East Ella flood alleviation scheme called EFAS. What other additional measures could be put in place to ensure better management of the alleviation pond level so the residents' houses and gardens are not affected by the flooding? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sutton. Councillor West. Afternoon, Chair. Uh, many parts of the East Riding have experienced garden and land flooding over the past few months. As a result of the wet autumn and winter, groundwater levels and water levels in watercourses have been exceptionally high and are only just starting to drop. Unfortunately, even though the properties which you refer to are so close to the Tramby Reservoir phase of the Annalby and East Ella Flood Alleviation Scheme, they are not within the benefit area and there is no hydraulic link. Officers from the Council's Flood Risk Management Team are aware of the garden flooding to properties in the area and have spent a considerable amount of time investigating and trying to understand any exacerbating factors. One particular property has experienced flooding, in, flooding to the garden as a result of adjacent watercourse overtopping. This watercourse is riparian owned and the responsibility of the adjacent landowners. The property owner in question being one of them. The watercourse discharges into culvert watercourse Acres Head Drain on, on First Lane, which is managed by the Environment Agency. For the reasons detailed above, water levels in the watercourses in the area have been exceptionally high over recent months. Officers are currently assessing options to reduce flood risk to the affected properties. And I would extend an offer to ward members in a particular area that we can get together with the relevant teams and go through the issues, possibly have a site visit to see how the relevant sort of infrastructure around that area operates. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor West. Councillor Sutton, are you desirous of a supplementary question? Are you well able to elaborate on the other things they're going to do? And yes, I will take you up on the offer. Thank you. Councillor West? I think it's probably best if you discuss that with the officers, not being a flood alleviation expert myself. But we can sort that out. We'll get some dates in data. Again, we move on to Councillor Johnson. Does the leader agree that lighting significant buildings with purple lights on International Women's Day has opened the conversation on violence against women and girls? And more venues should be encouraged to join the conversation by shining purple lights next International Women's Day. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Hammond to respond. Thank you, Chair. Members may remember at my uh, Cabinet Member update, the last full Council meeting, I did explain how East Riding Council actively encouraged people and organisations across the area to illuminate East Riding purple at the last International Women's Day. This was both for public venues using lights or for private residents to use things such as fairy lights in their private properties. Purple is used to represent dignity, power, creativity and hope. We received a lot of support from the public and 12 public venues across the East Riding did light themselves up purple. I agree that the council and our key partner agencies, Humberside Police and the Office of the Humberside Police and Crime Commissioner would like to see more venues and more of the public take part next year. And we will actively raise awareness and encourage people to do this. And I know Councillor Healing, who is not here, but Councillor S. McMaster took away from the last full council meeting to look at how they could do that in Wivensea after I gave my update, which I think shows great initiative and we can all encourage in our own wards people to do this. Finally, and I think vitally, it's not just important to raise the issue of violence against women and girls on International Women's Day. It's something we should be raising every day and doing all we can to tackle. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hammond. Do you have a supplementary, Councillor Johnson? Yes, thank you very much for that um, uh, reply, Councillor Hammond. Um, could we also perhaps use the purple lights 
on White Ribbon Day, which is November the 25th, and that would create double the impact. Councillor Hammond? Sure, that's something we could discuss as part of our White Ribbon Engagement Board, which myself and you sit on. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hammond. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the 6th of June 2024 is the 80th anniversary of the D-Day invasion, the largest seaborne invasion in history. Will this local authority be offering any financial support to our parish councils and other groups hosting events or lighting beacons marking this signature occasion? Thank you, Councillor Smith. Councillor Dewhurst to respond. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to Councillor Smith for this question. Members will be aware that this Council has run a number of pop-up funds in recent years. These have included the Tour of Britain Community Fund, the King's Coronation Community Fund last year, the Queen's Platinum Jubilee Fund in 2022, and the 75th anniversary of VE Day in 2020. In total, these funds have awarded hundreds of grants to our towns and parish councils and supported many, many wonderful events across the East Riding. I am therefore delighted to confirm the council will again administer another fund for town and parish councils wishing to hold events to mark the 80th anniversary of D-Day. Our rural team has begun to make arrangements and further details will be available in due course. Thank you very much, Councillor Dewhurst. Councillor Smith, no supplementary. Hmm. Am I correct? You were waving your hand in a sort of dismissive way, so I'm glad I inter uh, in interpreted that correctly. OK, we'll move on to Councillor Cousins. Does the leader agree that ward councillors should always be informed of any announcements, events, meetings or consultations impacting on their wards before these are made public and that any invitations to attend are issued formally and a minimum of 24 hours before the event? Thank you, Councillor Cousins. Councillor Handley to respond. Thank you very much, Chair, and many thanks, Councillor Cousins. Um, so your question actually covers announcements, events, meetings and consultations, which could draw in a number of matters depending on what Councillor Cousins' def definitions is. And I can only respond to the ones that are in relation that are organised by this council. And overall, I would say that ward councillors are kept in form of informed of issues and given sufficient notice where this is possible. And I say that because there are times as the leader of the council that I am called on within a couple of hours notice to actually be somewhere. That does happen. Unfortunately, there will be occasions, there you go, when it's not possible and notice cannot be provided. Recently, uh, we had Jock's Lodge and there was a photo opportunity. I did not hesitate in, ca in calling upon Councillor Estelle and his um, members to come and have a photograph opportunity. It is there, we do do that. If Councillor Cousins does have any particular event in mind, I would be happy to ask for the matter to be looked into and to consider whether any lessons can be learnt. However, I would not disagree with the suggestion that a minimum of 24 hours notice should be expected in most instances. Thank you, and thank you, Councillor Cousins. Thank you, Councillor Handley. Councillor Cousins, would you require a supplementary question? I'm pleased to see you were taking some time to think about that one. Thank you. We'll move on to Councillor Fox. Thank you, Chair. Um, could the leader please explain how we balance the need for new homes with the need for additional NHS services, such as doctors and pharmacists. Could we request a change in policy to allow commuter sums monies to be used for the provision of these services? Thank you, Councillor Fox. Councillor Hammond to reply. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Fox, for raising this important issue, which I know uh, many of our residents really care about. Through the allocation of housing sites in the East Riding Local Plan, full consideration is given to the necessary infrastructure requirements. The NHS has been consulted and detailed discussions took place in producing the infrastructure delivery statement that considers the impact of new development. 
The Integrated Care Board are also signatories to the local plan statement of common ground, which agreed on ongoing commitment to working together. Both these documents support the update of the local plan that's currently taking place. When a housing site is developed, there are many asks for the developer from open space and play and sports facilities, the delivery of affordable homes, education provision, new highway infrastructure, and now nationally required biodiversity net gain as well. Some sites have provided buildings for health services historically, such as in Pocklington and Market Wheaton. It isn't possible for a development site to fund every single possible service as it would very much quickly become unviable to develop such sites. That's why the local plan prioritises seeking funding for services where other funding is not possible or is very limited. And currently there is not the, that is not the case with doctor surgeries where other national funding streams and other delivery mechanisms are accessible. Work and information sharing will continue with the Integrated Care Board across the relevant council departments to ensure that all opportunities for enhancing the current facilities where needed are explored. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hammond. Councillor Fox, would you require a supplementary? I am concerned that local pharmacies are getting overwhelmed. What can we do as a council to help to support them? Thank you, Councillor Fox. Would you care to take that on, Councillor Hammond? Yeah, and I think it's a serious point to raise. I know the government is really pushing for people to use pharmacies rather than always going to their GPs. And of course, if, if they can't get into their pharmacies, then they're going to go back to the NHS. So I think it's something that perhaps myself and Councillor Tucker as Cabinet Member for Health and you, Councillor Fox, should meet up and have a discussion about how we as a council can take that forward and support pharmacies in these riding. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hammond. Councillor Gallant. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd like to ask the leader, knowing now, as we do from Freedom of Information, that council officers initiated the meetings that led to the Nuclear Waste Services proposal for South Holdovers in April 2023, during the election period, when none of us were councillors, by the way. Uh, Councillor Gallant, could you keep to the question as written? Yeah, yeah. And given the enormous scope, impact and controversial nature of this project, shouldn't it have been presented for approval to progress at an early stage to the Cabinet? Thank you. Councillor Handley. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Gallant. Nuclear Waste Services approached the Council as part of their search for a suitable site for ge geological disposable facility. Owing to the area's geology, they expressed an interest to explore the potential of a suitable location and willing community within East Yorkshire. As with other inward investment inquiries, you have a developer in this instance, it was NWS, seeking a suitable site for its new facility, with the potential to bring significant economic benefits to the area. It was therefore handed to Invest East Yorkshire, the council's inward investment team, to project manage. They are professional officers with the remit to support the growth of our local economy and have done so in securing major investments from large organisations such as Guardian Industries, Siemens Mobility and Pensana, to name but a few. It must also be recognised that the NWS GDF siting process in a consent based is, is a consent based process. Unlike other inv inward investments, it does not move from securing a suitable site directly to the submission of a planning application. It is complex with many stages which can take many years to work through. From the initial approach, there is the forming of a working group who are tasked with bringing the detail of the project to the community. This is done via a number of ongoing public information events, open meetings, a dedicated website and a dedicated contact centre. The stage beyond this involves the forming of a formal community partnership. During this stage, NWS start to undertake more technical research and all members of the community are given the opportunity to be, to be directly involved. 
As you will appreciate, with such a nationally significant investment, there is a lot of information to disseminate and much technical research to be undertaken. At some point, possibly up to 15 years from opening, opening the early conversation, but during the life of a community partnership, the community are ultimately asked to make the decision. This is referenced as the test of public support. Equally, the developer, NWS, may withdraw at any point because they may find through their technical research that the geology is not fit for purpose of such a facility. For those reasons, it was deemed not to require a formal decision to enter into the early working group conversation stage with the community. As you are aware, all party leaders were briefed in advance of the launch of the working group, as were local members then and then parish and town councils. Equally, senior officials from MWS also briefed the Right Honourable Graham Stewart MP. If the project had reached the stage of forming a community partnership, then yes, there would have been a detailed report presented to full council and a, dis a decision would have been required to allow NWS to continue to that next phase. However, at mentioned at full council on the 21st of February, we have formally withdrawn as the principal local authority and interested party from the NWS GDF siting process. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Councillor Gallant. Thank you, Councillor Handley. Do we have a supplementary, Councillor Gallant? Uh, thank you, Councillor Handley. Um, isn't it extraordinary that a controversial project of this scale was never presented to the Cabinet for approval? It took nearly a year before on first impact with this democratically elected chamber that it was thrown out almost unanimously. What seems to have been missing was a bit of common sense along the way. Uh, group leaders were informed about this on the 31st of October, but it was outside of a formal meeting and no consent was requested. Could we get to the question, please, Councillor Gallant? Shouldn't, yes, thank you, Chair. Shouldn't officers uh, in future refer any such controversial projects to Cabinet before progressing even to consultation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gallant. Councillor Henry. Chair, and thank you for your supplementary, Councillor Gallant. The situation was it hadn't even got as far as coming to Cabinet. It wasn't under discussion at Cabinet because we were nowhere near deciding, or the public were nowhere de near deciding what they did or did not want. So it couldn't come to Cabinet for any formal decision. It was just an investigation, which we quite rightly, unanimously voted out. Thank you. Thank you. Did you shut me off then, Sam? <laughs> Is that an indication of things to come? Uh, Councillor Nolan. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> At a time when this local authority is facing extreme pressure on its finances, having to make huge savings in public services, will the leader explain why planning officers are prepared to spend up to £20,000 in fees and officer time, forcing a builder at Three Coombs Yard Beverley to lower the height of a built new home when the approved building next to it is 13 millimetres lower? Thank you, Councillor Nolan. Councillor Hammond. Thank you for the Nolan Council question. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor Nolan. Thank you very much. I must admit, I was slightly surprised to see it on the agenda because I was always under the impression that members in this chamber were completely in favour of holding developers to account and standing by the decisions that we as elected members make. The majority of people, clearly not all, but the majority of people, I believe, view planning enforcement as integral to upholding the credibility of our planning system. And that's why this council places a high importance on this servant service. Having a team of officers dedicated to planning enforcement, which is something the council does not actually have to have. And a number of councils across the country do not have planning enforcement teams, but we choose to have one because we take the breaches of planning permission very seriously here in the East Riding. I'm pleased that we do take formal action when it is right to do so, 
and members will recall successful prosecutions of the past, such as when a developer demolished the former Travellers' Rest public house in Long Riston without the necessary planning approvals in place. Councillor Nolan appears to condone the fact that this development in Beverly has been built in breach of the plans approved by councillors at our own Eastern Area Planning Subcommittee. And I'll add, I actually sat on the subcommittee that day and I supported the application in question because the original application is quite fine, but this sadly has not been adhered to. Contrary to the frankly amateur press release which has gone out, the facts are the approved ridge height of the building is 7.167 metres. The actual ridge height that has been built is 7.67 metres, quite a massive difference. The approved eaves height of the building is 5.5 metres. The actual eaves height is 6.14 metres as built by the developer. The approved distance between the first floor windows and the eaves is 1.13 metres. The actual distance that has been built by the developer is 1.61 metres. Again, that's quite a big peanut if people listen to the press release. An enforcement notice has therefore been issued by the council requiring the developer to alter the building so that it fully accords with the approved plans. Again, plans approved by elected members in this chamber on our Eastern Area Planning Subcommittee. The notice has been appealed by the developer and the matter will now be considered by an independent planning inspector. Officers serve the notice because the differences between the approved plans and the development are considered to cause harm. As councillors will be aware, the site is in a sensitive location within the Beverly Conservation Area and in close proximity to a number of significant listed buildings. The development as built is considered to cause harm to these heritage assets by virtue of its inappropriate scale and design. In particular, the raising of the height of the eaves has created an overly large expanse of brickwork between the eaves and the first floor windows, which gives the building a top heavy and visually awkward character. It has also created a visibly slacker roof pitch, which is out of keeping with those that characterise the conservation area. I suspect the local ward councillors will agree with me for once when I, when I say I fully, when I say I'm fully behind officers, our officers in serving this enforcement notice and taking this action to protect this important conservation area. Councillor Nolan suggests that the council is prepared to spend up to £20,000 on this matter. I have absolutely no idea where this figure has come from, but I am happy to confirm that the costs to date of seeking to remedy this breach of planning control have been nothing more than the officer time taken to investigate the breach and serve the enforcement notice. I hope that explains why the council is taking robust action to protect the Beverly Conservation Area. As long as I remain in this post as planning a cabinet member, I will continue to encourage such action against those developers who do not deliver their developments in line with their planning permission. Equally, I will congratulate those developers who do and deliver great projects. As you will know, Chairman, we have seen some great entries for your Built Heritage Chairman's Award over the years. And interestingly, we have a submission this year from a property, Mowgli Restaurant, in the same setting and conservation area as this application in Councillor Nolan's question. And I believe members will see for themselves as part of the awards process. It shows you you can deliver fantastic properties, modern properties that enhance and complement conservation areas. They do not have to go against the conservation areas. We should protect conservation areas and I fully support our officers in doing that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hammond. May I remind members that whilst I sit in this chair, we do not have applause in the Council Chamber. Thank you. Councillor Nolan, I'm guessing you would like to have a supplementary. I, 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 can we have the penguins in, leaving the chamber, please? Um, uh, I, th I thank Councillor Hammond for his very comprehensive reply. Um, I always understood that we should judge the building as it's built rather than go back to plans. But I, I asked him this question. Given the building has been built and the planning officers have refused to determine the revised planning applications, does it not put the council in a weak position when uh, carrying out enforcement action when it hasn't actually dealt with what's been built? And can I ask him to uh, join with me, and I don't think he will, but can I ask him to join with me in urging the planning officers to engage in dialogue and find a common sense solution given the building has been built rather than using a sledgehammer? Well, thank you, Councillor Nolan. I believe you've actually got two questions to answer there, Councillor Hammond. For your questions, Councillor Nolan, um, I think the common sense solution is for applicants and developers to build 
their planning approvals in line with their permission, more so than ever when they are in the heart of a conservation area immediately next door to an important listed building. This council, as I said, takes planning breaches incredibly seriously and we will do all we can, especially with our fantastic na nation leading uh, design code on the horizon to protect the character of our settlements and our local communities. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hammond. Move on to Councillor Redshaw. Thank you, Chair. Um, Network Rail uh, said it has yet to, to receive any request for, for funding from the Department of Transport uh, to even start initial, de initial development work on the proposal to electrify the railway line between Hull and Selby and Hull and Sheffield. Uh, will the leader approach the Rail Minister to ask for timelines and confirmation of the government's commitment to this project? Thank you, Councillor Redshaw. Councillor Handley. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Councillor Redshaw. I'm on my third meeting with the Rail Minister, just, just to let you know about this very subject. Um, but it's already set out in our uh, Hull and East Yorkshire devolution uh, policy paper. Both local authorities will work with the government to electrify and to improve the rail speed between Hull to Leeds and Hull to Sheffield, cutting journey times for rail users and improving connectivity between our area and the north of England, as well as the wider regions of the UK. As the leader of East Riding of Yorkshire Council, I will write to the Rail Minister as soon as possible to raise the points made by Network Rail, which highlight the absence of any formal instruction from the Department of Transport to commence development work on electrifying the rail lines between Hull and Sheffield and Hull to Leeds. I am committed to ensuring robust connectivity, environmental sustainability and economic growth for our community. Therefore, I intend to approach the Rail Minister directly to seek clarity on the following matters. Firstly, on timelines, when can we expect the initiation of development work on the electrification project? Clear timelines are crucial for planning and resource allocation. Secondly, government commitment. Can government confirm their unwavering commitment to this endeavour? Our residents deserve assurance that this critical infrastructure project remains a priority. I will provide an update for members once I have received a response. And may I just add that next week I'm actually going for a meeting with Hugh Merriman, the Minister for Rail. And recently I picked up um, Lord McLaughlin from Bruff Station. I put him on a minibus at nine o'clock and I didn't let him get off till five o'clock. And I took him everywhere, and uh, Mr Menzies and Mr Bellotti uh, and Councillor West were part of that, and we went everywhere. I took him to the rail, I took him to the road, I showed him what we needed, and I met with Lord McLaughlin last week, and he said, I got a map out, I had a look where you took me, there was nowhere in the East Riding that you missed out. I said, I know, that was my job. So I can assure everybody in this chamber I am doing my best. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Handley. Uh, Councillor Redshaw, do you require a supplementary? Yes, please. Um, may I, first of all, thank you, uh, thank uh, Councillor Handley for her uh, uh, endeavours. Uh, my concern is that the Minister is clearly only offering vague promises that he seemingly has no intention of delivering. Uh, and really, how confident is the leader that we can secure any credible timelines or commitments to funding before this government leaves office, especially given that this was lauded, uh, as uh, Councillor Handley mentioned, as one of the benefits of the devolution deal. Thank you, Councillor Redshaw. Councillor Hadley. Thank you, Councillor Redshaw. Thank you, Chairman. I will endeavour personally to do my best to make sure I can get a timeline out of this government for when it's going to start. We in the north are, or sorry, in the east riding of Yorkshire and Hull are left behind on many areas when it comes to transport. I sit on the board for the Transport for the North and I can assure you, people now know where we are. People now know that there's a world past Leeds because I certainly let them know on a regular basis, Councillor Redshaw, and will continue. I will come back from meeting the Rail Minister and I will send out the update to all councillors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Handley. Councillor Needham. 
Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, does the Leader of the Council agree with me that the current response time to elected members from some officers is not acceptable when it's often weeks later? Can she confirm what the agreed response time should be in days as discussed at the Ward Cluster meeting in February? Councillor Handley. Councillor Needham, um, actually, um, from that Ward Cluster meeting, I've also met, had other Ward Cluster meetings and there are some in the diaries for the rest of you and it seems to be a common thread that um, our councillors are having issues with uh, officers coming back to them. I think it might be um, the right thing to do to send out the protocol of how we actually contact um, the officers or our um, um, group members to, to, do, to work on our behalf, our secretaries to work on our behalf there is a protocol that we have to hit. Now, I know that we have to we have to come back within you have to come back as officers within five days to let councillors know that you have acknowledged we have an issue that needs addressing. I don't think those five days turnaround we can actually solve all problems in five days, but some acknowledgement would be greatly appreciated. And I think maybe we just need to send out the protocol. Um uh, again to just show the best way to do it it's really easy to pick up a phone and go directly to an officer who was inundated if we do it through the officers they will chase it on our behalf so maybe that might be a better way going forward but thank you councillor needham it does need picking up i totally agree thank you very much and thank you chair thank you councillor handley councillor needham do you Go for it. Yeah, thank you for the, uh, the response there. It would be very useful to have that protocol sent out. I'm just wondering whether the uh, Leader of the Council would agree that perhaps that we should have a league table of departments and we show the performance uh, by department there. Um, I would only hope that some of those responses um, appear higher in the league than Newcastle United do in the Premier League. Thank you. I was awaiting a footballing refer reference there. Uh, Councillor Handley. Uh, well, thank you very much, Chair. I'm afraid to me that didn't make much sense because I don't understand football and I have no idea where Newcastle is. Uh, but yes, um, I, I think transparency um, should be always recognised and we should always look. Um, I don't know about league tables, but certainly we, uh, we we need to know where we've got the issues and try and rectify them. So, yeah, thank you very much indeed, Councillor Needham. Thank you, Councillor Hanley. That brings us to the end of question time. Until next time. Item 11 is outside body questions. There are no questions. Item 12 is appointment of honorary older men and older women. This is complicated, so please pay attention. First of all, we'll have Councillor Hanley moving, uh, and then uh, I will be asking for a proposal and seconder, which are all written down here, so we know who we are. It's just a putting up of the hand. It's not a question of making long speeches on behalf of somebody or other. It's merely getting the protocol through so we know who we're actually getting as older men and older women on the 16th of May. So first of all, I shall invite Councillor Handley to move the report. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to move the report. And it is recommended that in accordance with Section 249 of the Local Government Act 1972, the council confers the title of honorary alderman and older woman on the following former councillors in recognition of their en eminent service to this council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, second, Councillor Dewhurst. Oh, thank you, Chair. I beg to second. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, David Norman Rudd to be proposed by Councillor Dewhurst and seconded by Councillor Owen. Councillor, uh, ex-Councillor Phil Davison to be proposed by Councillor Johnson. Sorry, I've gone a bit too quick there. I'm trying to get as much done before I have to disappear. Uh, right, we have to vote on each one. So if you'd like to vote using your magic buttons for David Norman Rudd, press green. If you're against him, press Red. Councillor Helby, please. Thank you. 
Councillor Meredith, stop it. Right, with the vote for David Norman Rudd, he is uh, now going to be an honorary alderman. And the next one we have is Phil Davison, Councillor Johnson to propose, uh, Councillor Healy to second. And if you would like to vote, utilising your magic buttons. Bill Davison is to be an alderman. And now we move on to Jane Everson, Councillor Owen to propose, and Councillor Lee to second. And if you'd like to vote, utilising your magic buttons. An honorary older woman. And we move on to Christopher John Matthews, better known to us all as Chris. Councillor Holtby to propose. Councillor Owen to second. Thank you very much. All those in favour of Mr Matthews. I think uh, that uh, Christopher John Matthews is to be an alderman. Thank you very much for your diligence and speed and alacrity. Councillor Handley, uh, can I call upon you to close the debate, please? Thank you, Chair. I'd like to close the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Handley. We now move on to the vexed question of the exemption. Oh, crikey. Move. Ah. Yes, it's an overall vote. Sorry about that. All those in favour of that. Right, there we are. Thank you very much. Just waiting until you finish your various conversations. The Council is asked to consider excluding the press and public from the meeting during consideration of the following item on the grounds that it is likely to involve the disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph 1 of part 1 of Schedule 12A of the Local Government Act 1972. In making its decision, the Council is asked to confirm that having regard to all circumstances, it is satisfied that the public interest in maintaining the exemption outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information. Please can I have a show of hands from members before I close the public part of the meeting to consider this exempt minute of the Cabinet. Thank you. I will now exclude any press and public from the meeting